Welcome, everybody. We're so happy to have you here with us both in person over lunch and online for our 2023 Siegel Fellows in Action panel. My name is Susie Plume Silva, and I'm the director of the Eli J. and Phyllis N. Siegel Christian Leadership Program. Um, and our assistant director, Carmela Belzer, is also hosting this event with us. We're going to be sharing her remarks and facilitating the second half of the question. So, for those of you who don't know us, the Eli J. and Phyllis and Siegel Citizen Leadership Program is housed here in the Institute for Economic and Racial Equity at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis. And this year we're celebrating Brandeis' 75th anniversary, uh, Heller's 65th anniversary, and the Siegel Program's 15th anniversary. And so uh, lots to be proud of and lots to celebrate. Our mission is to inspire and empower generations of civic and community leaders across sectors, issue areas, and lived experiences. Our lifelong Siegel Fellows, including these wonderful folks, are citizens of the world who uplift equitable systems and create a more just world through connection and action, continuing the work of Eli and Phyllis Siegel. You can see on your screen some of the key components of our program, and our fellows will be mentioning some of those today. Um, we also have our core competencies at the heart of our program, and these are some of the elements that Google Citizen Leaders, we want them to be able to do and to know, and you might hear reference to some of these from our speakers today as well. So some of you are here or are listening online because you're interested in applying to become a Siegel Fellow. Thank you for your interest. The application is open right now for Brandeis students and Heller education students to apply, and you can apply through October 23rd. So if you are interested in applying, you'll hear some great information today. We welcome you to come to our office hours to check us out online, to reach out to me and Carmelo or the Siegel Fellows. And our next information session is next Wednesday at Hyde. Um, center, career center at 1230. So we hope you'll apply and enjoy this amazing group of fellows. The Siegel program since its beginning has been this incredible vision of a meaningful and intergenerational network, as we said, across sectors and issue areas. So the Siegel family, the Siegel founders, the Siegel friends, partners, donors, and supporters since the beginning um, and the, the Siegel Fellows themselves make up this really powerful network. So we're lucky to be joined today online by our namesake and program founder, Phyllis Siegel. Hi, Phyllis. <laughs> and also by John Siegel. And we're also grateful to our advisory board chair, Maura Siegel. Um, we're so happy, as we said, to be housed here at Irie Heller. And we have Irie director, Lisa Lynch here, who's been a longtime Siegel um, program supporter and founder. And we'll hear our closing remarks from interim Dean Maria Madison. So um, in addition to thanking all of you who are joining us in person on online, we have a big thank you to, to our internship partners. These are people who give their time each summer to help our Siegel Fellows grow in their leadership and have an impact in their organizations and agencies. And so you can see here, uh, this summer, we had an internship partner who was also a donor, Prisoners Legal Services in Massachusetts, where Catherine uh, Nace was interning. And you'll also see here the names of the amazing supervisors that our fellows will mention that supported them. Our other internship partners this year, Georgia Asylum and Immigration Network, where Anthony Ruiz was, International Institute of New England, where Amelia Trahan was, the Mass Health Hospital Association, where Davida Fell was, also at the Health Career Connector Fellow, and Mass Inc., where Zayda Mullen was. And I will say Ben Foreman and Mass Inc. have been a repeated host and partner for Siegel Fellows and Heller students. So thank you to our new and learning partners. We have a really inspiring group of 2023 Heller and Brandeis Siegel Fellows. You all are amazing. Um, and what you shared and how you grew individually with each other are during our spring of this leadership curriculum was so powerful. Uh, also your summer internships, um, your reports on them, which we'll hear more about, but also their host site supervisors just raving about how amazing they were. Um, and each of you are balancing so much uh, in your life beyond your fellowship and your internship this year. So we're, we're grateful to you. Two of our fellows are joining us virtually today because they're studying abroad. So first we'll hear from Anthony Ruiz, who has a recorded introduction to share. 
Um, then we'll get to hear uh, live from Egypt, from Amelia, and then we'll get to hear from our panelists here. And after they share some introductions, Carmela Belazer will facilitate a panel and we'll leave time for you to ask questions at the end. So thank you again for being here online and in person. Hey y'all, I hope you guys are doing well and enjoying the Seagull Fellows in Action panel presentation. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there with y'all in real time, but we're gonna make the best of it. So my name is Anthony Ruiz and I'm a Brandeis undergraduate Seagull Fellow. And this past summer, I interned with the Georgia Asylum and Immigration Network. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about that experience. Like I said, I'm a junior and I'm double majoring in anthropology and Latin American Caribbean Latinx studies or LACLS for short and minor in history. So first off, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my interest and why GAIN really attracted me. So I have always had an interest in immigration law. First off, just because I come from an immigrant family, my dad's a Mexican American immigrant. And I've always been interested in our American immigration system and the bureaucracy that surrounds it. And because of this, when I entered college at Brandeis, I immediately gravitated towards another nonprofit organization that's in Waltham, which is TREE, the Right to Immigration Institute. And so at this organization, I had the opportunity to learn more about immigration law, the specific processes and opportunities that the US offers um, for immigration, and just how to work with clients and do that direct facing client work. And so taking this experience, I really wanted to work more locally with my own Metro Atlanta community and to see the differences in immigration policy and patterns. And so throughout my internship, I did a lot of similar things that I did with Tree. However, I was able to do a lot more client-facing work. And so throughout the internship, I primarily worked on asylum, temporary protected status, which is when a country is designated in need of temporary status for refugees. So for example, some of these countries that are included right now are Ukraine and Afghanistan. And I also worked on U visa cases, which are for victims of domestic violence. And so a typical day at the office, it just honestly depends about the upcoming cases and what our clients need. So some of that work includes, like I said, direct facing client work. So calling your client over the phone to go over some immigration documents, answer any questions, work with a translator if they need it. Uh, but additionally, some of that work also includes doing country conditions research and policy research and looking into countries that we are working with clients from. And other things that I would do throughout my internship are drafting legal memos, reviewing other applications, and just office things that would just come up at a law firm, such as organizing files, things of that nature. So it's a really roundabout jack of all trades experience that I was able to have. And throughout this internship experience, I developed a, not, a taste for nonprofit development and management. And I really am thrilled of my experience with GAIN just because I was able to utilize my Seagull Spring mentorship semester. And I was really able to see the core competencies in action, particularly core competency five that really stood out to me, which is that change requires a range of resources, including financial talent and time. And this is what I really appreciate about GAIN, that it wasn't, we weren't just an immigration uh, form, an immigration support service. You know, we also worked with our clients to make sure that they were secure in other facets of life, such as housing, food, rent, things of that nature. And I really, throughout this internship, I valued the skills, I learned how to value the skill of versatility and trauma-informed care that I've been really working to strengthen throughout my experience as a citizen leader. And so I know that was brief, but if you guys do have any further questions about the specifics, of, the specifics of my internship or just wanted to ask, my email is just my name at brandeis.edu. And I also am providing my LinkedIn down below. Thank you guys and enjoy the rest of the presentation. Bye -bye. Thank you so much to Anthony, who's studying abroad in Argentina. And we're very excited now to get to hear um, Amelia. Hello, everybody. My name is Amelia. I use they pronouns. Um, I'm a Seagull Fellow, uh, undergraduate class of 2024 with a double major in English and Sociology and a minor in Asian American Pacific Islander Studies. 
Um, as you can tell, I'm not there because if I was, I'd be in person, but I'm actually uh, studying abroad at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. Um, I'll be here for a couple of months and I'll be back at Brandeis in the spring, so I'm very excited for that. Um, in regards to the internship I conducted this summer, I interned with the International Institute of New England, uh, which is a um, kind of immigration refugee settlement resettlement program. Um, there, I specifically worked in their ESOL programming, so English as a second language classes. There, I assisted in leading breakout rooms because uh, these classes were held virtually. Um, and I also helped to create some course material. For example, uh, I created speaking activities. Speaking activities can be like, um, what are the steps to make a pizza? Or um, what do you do in the event of a car accident? Um, some real life scenarios that our students use on a day-to-day -day basis or they could use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, cahoots and word walls to spark student engagement as well. Um, this really helped with their ability to learn grammar. So this summer we worked heavily on present continuous. Um, and so I made a lot of present continuous cahoots and word walls. Last but not least, I also created a digital literacy research document. This document essentially had a assortment of different resources uh, for um, to for our students to have digital literacy um, skills. Um, for example, how to log into Zoom, how to log out of Zoom, how to send an email, how to open an email, things like that, that some of our students, especially coming in to these classrooms, might not know how to do, um, at least in the English language. And so we have to revert back to their native language and find these resources in their native language. And that's kind of what I did. And so I have Arabic, French, Ukrainian, um, Urdu, a bunch of other um, kinds of, thank you. I can't help but look at the comments. Um, a bunch of other languages as well um, listed in that document. And it's a live, it's a living document. And so the organization can add and take away to it as much as they want, whenever they want to. Um, that's a little bit about my um, internship experience. It was really great. I really enjoyed it. Um, this kind of ties back to my areas of interest, which is teaching English as a second language, uh, refugee and migration, U.S. education reform for minority communities, and international education. Um, as you can see, I'm really interested in education. This kind of stems from um, my passion for education and also from a little bit of my background experience in education. For example, last summer, I actually worked as a writing teacher through Breakthrough Collaborative. Um, and Breakthrough Collaborative is a nationally recognized institution which, or program in which they provide um, educational programs to underrepresented communities. Um, and so after that, I also went to Morocco and uh, I studied abroad in Morocco last fall. I do a lot of things, I guess. Um, and after my time in Morocco and also after my time working with Breakthrough Collaborative, I kind of found a real interest in international education. And so the Seagull Fellowship was able to help, was able to help me secure a internship with the International Institute of New England to learn more about my interest in teaching English as a second language, what international education looks like. Um, it is because of Seagull that I have also been connected with so many people in the field of interest that can support me in my career endeavors. Um, shout out to Sherry Spaulding, Jennifer Yu, Diane Lauber, all the teachers um, that I worked with at INE who really helped me to grow um, in my background in education and my skills as well. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I heard a lot of laughing. Where's the clapping? Or do no, I just not? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Julia. And um, that's what we're from Julia Bell, who is here in between classes. So thank you for putting that in. Hi, I'm Julia Bell. Um, I am a Brandeis undergrad and I'm a junior. Major in neuroscience, minor in psychology, and maybe even in statistics. Uh, we'll see. Um, but I am a STEM student. I am wearing my lab fashion, my lab gear, because I got lab in a few minutes. But I'm definitely going to make all time to come here. And I just want to thank the Siegel program for um, accepting me and then helping me. 
find an internship, helping me guide me and like find like what I want to pursue. So before I get into what I did for my internship, my areas of interest is healthcare equity, um, healthcare reform, policy work, and like applying to Siegel, um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do and I'm very flexible and open. And that's what I love about like me. I am open and willing to explore. So I allow Siegel to like help and guide me in that process. Also for me, I want to be a dentist, hopefully. Amen, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I want to be a dentist. I I think that there should be more um, people of color, more Black dentists and doctors in the healthcare system representing us, being able to advocate for us in those um, sense in the healthcare space because we know how to treat our own population. So I think it's really important to have people to represent us in those spaces. So I wanted to try and explore health policy more and reform. So this is how I found MHA. Actually, it's a complicated process. It, it's very hilarious. Um, I applied to Siegel, and then I also applied to Health Career Connections, which I feel like is kind of similar to Siegel, where they help impair um, students with host organizations for a uh, health-related internship. So I had the privilege to be with not only a Siegel fellow, but an ACC fellow, and they both helped me and helped find me an internship. And so I was able to work at Massachusetts Health Association. And fun fact, um, my supervisor was actually a Brandeis alum and also went to Brent to the Heller School. So, you know, full circle moment. I feel like, I feel like that helped me a lot. She was like, well, I like you. She was like, here you go. I said, Brandeis, she said, me too. So I think that really helped me a lot. But also having my supervisor, her name is Amy, just helped and guide me. She was really there for me. So a little bit about what I did this summer. So I had the ability to conduct policy research and I did a lot of my work with substance abuse disorder and also medical, not emergency medical transportation. And I never really heard of that before, but it's apparently a huge problem in mass. So right now, like what I did this summer was to try to find different solutions to um, have meta, what? What, what is the public insurance called here? Mass Health, yes. <laughs> I, I'm from Atlanta, so I don't, I don't know a lot about Massachusetts. But so we were trying to come up with different policy um, recommendations to see how Mass Health can cover non-emergency medical transportation so it won't fall on the patients and also that they don't have to worry about paying out of pocket. And this is a huge problem because a lot of the um, hospitals didn't want to pay for the system. And because of that, a lot of patients was left in hospital beds, occupying them, leaving it, um, leaving hospital beds, not being able to be filled by people who actually need it. So people, oh, so patients are stuck in hospital beds when they need to um, be sent to like behavioral health center or behavior, behavioral health um, doctors. And they're unable to get that transportation because ambulance services refuse or didn't want to pay for that cost. And because they were taking nine emergency um, billings, they were unable to tend to medical to actual emergency, emergency like billing. So it, it was a lot of factors going into like why non-emergency medical transportation needs to be taken seriously. So I was able to come up with that and it was really fun and interesting to actually like do research on like what other health systems in other states, what are they doing to address this problem? Because it's a problem nationwide. Secondly, I was able to do a lot of educational outreach and this was actually the fun side of my internship, other than like the analysis. I really enjoyed um, having the flexibility to create and curate like webinars. And that was my big project for the summer is I created my own webinar. I did, it, I came up with the idea. I reached out to the panelists. I orchestrated everything. And it was really, it was really challenging. I was very nervous and I was scared. It was something that I wanted to like, do but I was scared of how it would be executed, how it would come in the final project. But towards the end, it was really meaningful. I was able to do something that I was passionate about. I was able to talk about a topic that was really near and dear to my heart. So my webinar was about how medical students or how medical schools are trying to make that change to make their curriculum more inclusive for um 
um, students of color, how they are considering how um, other ethnic groups in the way that they teach medicine to their pay, to their students. So when they go out into the real world and become residents and physicians, that they're able to um, use those skills that they learn in medical school to apply to a wide range of patients. And this is important because of a lot of medical discrimination, a lot of medical um, invalidation that a lot of POC face in the healthcare system. And because of the practices that they are taught in medical school, they are bringing that into practice. So how are our medical schools making that change and how that translate into residency programs and further on. So I'm happy that I was able to start that discussion. And now MHA is hosting a series of webinars talking about this topic, and now they want to aim and talk to residency programs and talk to medical directors and hospital systems. So I'm able, so I'm happy that I was able to do that. Lastly, um, I attended a lot of stockholder um, meetings and legislative hearings. I had the privilege to actually go up to, um, I think it's Boston City. Oh my God. I don't know nothing in that, <laughs> but I was the Capitol Hill, I think the State House, yes. I'm not involved, I'm proud of it, I'm sorry. Um, but I was able to go there and like listen in to a legislative hearing about public health reform in Massachusetts, and it was really refreshing to hear. And I say all this to just tie back to why I chose Siegel. Siegel helped me like go out of my comfort zone. I'm a very hands-on person, I love being very active, and Doing this internship was a big challenge for me because it was more of a sit down job at a desk. And I don't know if I am for that life. But, <laughs> but yes, laugh. I love to laugh. I love making jokes. But um, what I really enjoyed about my internship is I could see myself in a career in like health administration, health education, and outreach. Not just um, like I can definitely see myself as a dentist, but I always wanted to explore more into healthcare in general because there are so many things you can do in healthcare and just being able to have that opportunity to explore potentials. Like I never would have considered um, like health policy before this summer and I'm happy that I did it. And now I'm considering other careers in um, healthcare like healthcare consulting. So having that, and I really do thank you Susie and Camilla, like you really did help me and um, I guess since I have to leave early because of my um, lab, one of the questions for the panel is like, how did I advocate? How did I uplift the community? And I would definitely say, um, speaking up for myself, I definitely spoke up for myself and what I wanted, and I knew that I what I wanted, and I knew the value that I had that I could bring to MHA, and they saw that in me, and I didn't have to. Um, bent over backwards. They could, they saw my potential and I knew what I had to offer. So that was really comforting that they believed in me and they, they brought me in. So I guess, yeah, that's, that's my little intro. Thank you. Um, so we're going to to start in a few minutes of five hour lab. I think. So congratulations. Thank you. That's a, that's a tough act to follow. I might not have as many jokes. <laughs> also, Jovita, there's a, a health policy concentration for the MPP program. If you're curious, I <laughs> plug. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, my name is Catherine Mace. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a second year MPP student um, concentrating in economic and racial equity. Um, and I'm just going to start off talking about why I was excited to join the Siegel Network as a Siegel Fellow. Um, I always love talking to people about what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, and what they care about. And I knew that this was an opportunity for me to really connect with people that were also really engaged in the work in like a really intentional way. Um, and I've definitely found that. And I've had a great opportunity to collaborate with other people in the network and the other fellows. As you've heard, they all have very wide interests. Um, and so that's been a great part of the experience for me. Um, and I've always been really passionate about mental wellness. Um, I studied psychology in my undergraduate degree, and it did not take long for me to see when looking at, you know, mental health diagnoses and substance use, how quickly you also run into the criminal punishment system um, and how you cannot really 
separate one from the other, honestly. Um, so that's kind of where a lot of my studies here at Heller have been focused on that interlap, um, on that like overlap between the two, um, but also thinking more broadly about alternative approaches to public safety um, and ways to push for decarceration. Um, so that kind of brings me to where I ended up for my summer internship, um, which is Prisoners Legal Services of Massachusetts, also known as GLS. Um, and they are a nonprofit that provides legal services to folks that are incarcerated across the entire state of Massachusetts. Um, and they historically have been very litigation focused and they are still very litigation focused, um, but they within the last few years started building out a policy team. Um, so that was who I was working with under the direction of the policy director, Jesse White, who was phenomenal and was a huge part of me having such a great summer experience. So shout out to her. Um, but, um, and I also was really fortunate to stay on part-time in a paid capacity through the fall semester. So I'm really excited to be able to keep working with them um, throughout the semester and see some of the work keep um, moving forward. Um, so some of the tasks I, I did slash am still doing um, are meeting with clients to really center their lived and living experiences. So um, meeting with folks that are currently incarcerated and hearing what they care about and what they want us to advocate for and their feedback on the bills and really letting that guide how we advocate and engage in policy work in general moving forward, which is a really critical component um, that drew me to engage with PLS in the first place because that was the way that they approached the work. Um, and then also collaborating with different legislators and legislative staff and advocacy organizations across the state. Um, there are so many people really, really involved in this work and really close to it and really leading it. So just using um, our role as an organization and having access to folks that are directly impacted um, and engaging with ad advocacy efforts that um, are being led across the state, um, which was really great. Um, and then also alongside the um, communications intern and the communications director, Aaron, who is also one of my um, supervisors and is also fantastic, shout out to him. Um, we developed and executed, slash are still executing um, a six week social media education campaign um, that breaks down all five of PLS's priority bills. So they have a whole plethora of legislation that they support. Um, but we are really trying to educate folks um, on what the bills were, what they meant, how they could learn more, how they could engage and support them if they so chose. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, definitely check out PLS's social media, it's still going on. Um, and then um, also researching for and supporting drafting of our baseline conditions bill testimony. So I did a lot of um, like background research about why it's important um, in PLS's um, perspective on it and contributing to that drafting process so that that's prepared when it's heard um, before the Public Safety Committee sometime in the fall. Um, and I really enjoyed that process because I feel like I could use a lot of the skills too that I've been learning in the MVP program as well um, in like a real life scenario. So I, that was a great part of it. Um, and while I was at PLS, I was really able to use um, like teamwork and critical thinking skills when we were collaborating across all these different organizations. We were doing working with nonprofits, different coalitions, mm -hmm. obviously our clients, legislators, um, to just think really intentionally about how we want to engage with the criminal punishment system and the work that we want to advocate for. So those are a couple of skills that um, I really was able to use throughout the summer. Um, and I also learned throughout this whole experience that sometimes the most meaningful pieces of policy work are not always tangible results or products. So I'm the kind of person that I like to have like a final product in a pretty box and be like, here, I'm finished. Um, but I learned that a lot of the work that I did over the summer was really relationship building and listening and building rapport and realizing that policy work takes a long time. Um, and really investing in that and understanding that um, and doing a lot of groundwork up at the beginning that's necessary to make any like meaningful policy work happen and meaningful policy change happen. Um, so that was something that I um, I took away. That was definitely a little challenging for me and like my personality, my work style, um, but ultimately I think it was a really great and really important lesson to learn. Um, so I just want to wrap up by giving a huge thanks to um, the Sequel staff, Susie and Carmela. Um, I know they do so much behind the scenes, um, as well as Erie and Lisa, um, for just supporting the program in general. Um, I'm so appreciative for, for you two and helping me find this placement. Um, and then also a huge shout out to PLS um, and any, if any of the staff are online. Um, and Jesse and Ada and Nikki and Aaron for making my experience like truly so meaningful. So, thank you. Thank you so much. And last but definitely not least, Kayla Mullen, first to have the speaker for me. Oh,
Hi, my name is Dana Ballin. I'm a sec well, actually, a second year MPP MBA student, and I learned how to see a fellowship through just um other fellows who graduated this year, last year, and I really want to be involved because I had a public government background already, so I knew that other opportunities I've done, so I wanted to do something different, but I am really interested in housing. And so before I delve into where I was placed, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, in 2001, my family immigrated to this country from Somalia, or fled the war, the Civil War. Um, I attended schools in Massachusetts all throughout from elementary to undergrad, and also now graduate school. Um, I did a year of service as an AmeriCorps member, and also worked in the public sector in the city of Boston, and then worked in fundraising afterwards at Wentworth, um, helping mostly BIPOC and diverse students get scholarships. Um, and so when I looked at this opportunity, I thought it was a phenomenal opportunity, not only because it would give me an opportunity to explore something different, but it was looking at how housing is uh, advocated for by like nonprofits and think tanks where I was placed, but also give me a new lens of like how the think tanks like mass ink were advocating for something that I deeply cared about. So, um, yeah, mass ink, if you don't know, uh, is a Nonprofit think tank that mostly does advocacy and, and research around education and housing. And my interest was in housing, and thankfully, Susie from Friday even chose <laughs> where I was going to be placed, um, uh, presented that thing to me. And I was already familiar with their work because of my work in government before. So it was a really natural, like, natural fit for me. Um, thankfully, I was um, placed with someone that I really deeply respect, which is Ben Corbin, if he's here. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so for me, in my internship, I studied um, the day-to-day -day looked like looking at various national and local data sets about housing within the city of New Bedford because New Bedford is a very special place because there's many cities in Massachusetts which are communities that are very welcoming to immigrants and low-income populations. And so if you know anything about New Bedford, it's that it's very, there's heavily concentrated poverty, but there's also a lot of opportunity and they're very dedicated public servants and just how the people there. And so I worked with Ben Foreman in the lease also um, to look at research points for the Economic Development Committee of the Mayor Commission there. And so at the end of my internship there, um, we finished, we presented to, to the Economic Development Committee on just what the housing portfolio of New Bedford looked like and what the future could look like if the market continued the way that, that it's going right now. And um, we're also working on a report um, with Nassing and also the Economic Development Committee to make sure that we're capturing everything that we studied from our national data sets. My main takeaways from this is that like this work is a marathon. Um, my supervisor, Susie Carmelo, and everyone that worked with me reminded me to make sure to take breaks throughout this time. And also I learned, or it kind of reaffirmed for me that housing is a fundamental part of making matches a place to live. And it's also an important humanitarian issue, as you know. Um, the governor recently declared a state of emergency and to get more funding for housing to place all the migrants that are coming into the state. And also, um, I also learned that we need intentionality in centering the needs of the most vulnerable populations. And that was kind of highlighted by Jovita and Catherine too about like supportive housing for people who have mental health issues and also people who are recently decarcerator and um, exiting out of the carceral system. And so I learned a lot about those issues as well. And finally, as a CEQA fellow, I learned about the importance of meaningful research can have on having transformative policies that can help to repair the harms that have been done to black and brown communities. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad that you guys hear from all five of our 2023 Brandeis and Heller Siegel Fellows live. And um, for this next portion, we're going to have a little bit of a panel facilitated by Carmela Belazer. And as I said, she's our Siegel Program Assistant Director. And next month, she'll be doing her one year anniversary in the role of the program. And we're very grateful to have her here. Amazing. Hi, everybody. My name is Carmela. Again, um, I serve as Siegel's Assistant Director. And first and foremost, before we get into the Q&A um, for our fellows, let's give them all a round of applause collectively. 
Congratulations. Congratulations on finishing your internship and congratulations on continuing on as lifelong fellows. Um, their focus ranged from immigration, education, healthcare, advocating for the rights of incarcerated folks, and housing. The range of sectors, experience, and dedication inspires us in ways to get involved and take action within our communities. So thank you for sharing your experiences and also choosing Siegel as your lifelong community. The 2023 Siegel Fellows crafted three questions to expand on a bit. Due the time, we just shortened it to three instead of four. Um, to share a bit more on their experiences, similar to what Javita had shared during her presentation in a panel format, including Anthony's recorded um, answers. So um, after these questions, we'll open up the space for a Q&A, both virtually and in person. So prep your questions, write them down for fellows. So first and foremost, um, what new experiences did the Siegel Summer Internship offer you as a citizen leader? We'll start off with Amelia online. Hi, um, I think it provided me with a new perspective on education through a refugee and migration lens. Um, my family actually came to the US as refugees from Cambodia. Um, and when they did, my grandmother went through a refugee resettlement program, it was like a sponsorship program. And so she received actually classes that are very similar um, to the ones that I worked in. And so it was interesting to kind of look at these classes from a kind of teacher or educator perspective um, and imagine my grandmother, my mother, and the rest of my family members in the position of being a refugee going through these courses, seeing kind of the difficulties that they have with, one, completing the courses, um, and also, to resettling into a country that's foreign to them. Um, and so, yeah. Thank you. Um, we're doing Anthony last, so Catherine. Hello. Okay. Um, I So I kind of shared a little bit about this in my presentation. So I want to share something that I think was a good perspective to highlight that we learned in the spring semester during our leadership cohort meetings, um, which was thinking kind of critically introspectively about how we're showing up into these spaces. So we had different sessions, like breaking down different parts of our identity and thinking about that critically. Um, and then also different parts of like thinking about our strengths and how we can show up in spaces using those. Um, and then also like areas for growth. And I think all of those things, like knowing more of that about yourself can make you a more effective agent of change and like better equipped to collaborate with people in the community. Um, so that was something I took away from our leadership sessions. Say that's next, I assume. Mm -hmm. So for me, I always kind of knew this, but it just kind of hit me because when we went to the economic development committee meetings in the city of New Bedford, um, there was a very different stakeholders. There was people from the public sector, health sectors, people all across the city that came from these different sectors. And I think for me, I'm very idealistic. So I was just like, it, I know how the world should be, but then also it's good to always have people who give you the reality check of just like how things are currently. And so one of the developers who's very well good intention was saying how um, as much as like affordable housing is good for the public, it just, currently understand the law and policies we have, the numbers just don't work. So um, not that gave me a lot of takeaway to just like make sure that we're trying to build an incentives to make sure that the numbers do work in the future. Amazing. So we'll have Anthony answer. Hey y'all. Um... So in regards to the first question, what new perspectives did the Siegel Summer Internship offer you as a citizen leader? I think for me, the one thing that it really showed me was the importance of valuing and understanding your soft skills. I feel like a lot of times in the workforce, we place such a big interest on specific deliverable hard skills and quantitative skills, when I think we need to remember that it's just as important to have these soft skills. So for example, one thing that really stood out to me is one's necessity and ability to empathize with your client and work directly with them, specifically in the legal field, but I'm sure this applies to other fields as well. This ability to just listen and provide emotional support to someone outside of 
what specific task you're trying to get done. Because at the end of the day, as citizen leaders, what we're the task is trying to support the communities that you're working with. And I think this is something that is really important for all citizen leaders. Okay, so second question, what were the most useful ways you've leveraged the Siegel network and Siegel program resources over the past year? We'll start again with Amelia. Um, I actually utilized the development fund that Siegel, the fellowship provides. Um, I utilized that to get a certification in teaching English as a second language um, online as well as in person. Um, everything that I learned through this certification process definitely helps me through my internship this summer. Um, it aided me in the skills that I was building as well as the background that um, I was getting as well. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, I also I also use the Leadership Development Fund, but I it helped um, support public transportation costs for me to go to in-person events, which was really useful. Um, I was able to attend a few things at the State House and go to the office. Um, those in-person interactions are really meaningful for me, so I feel like it definitely added an extra layer um, to my summer experience. And then I also leveraged um, the buddy system that they give us. Um, so we have like a Siegel buddy. Um, and mine is Leah Sakala, and it was wonderful getting to meet with her throughout the spring and throughout the summer, and I'm going to keep bugging her because <laughs> she just has so much great advice to give, and she was just helping with, like, picking out classes and, like, how to engage in this, like, tough conversation and um, how to leverage the Siegel Network in general, um, so I'm just really appreciative of her and her time um, and being able to use that resource that's a part of the Siegel Network. Mine's more of, like, Seagull buddy slash Seagull community. And for me, my mom recently passed this summer and um, it's very difficult, but it's also like reaffirmed for me the importance of having community. And in particular, I want to just give a shout out to Zena, my Seagull buddy, and also Susie and Carmela and Ben and everybody at Massings because they were really extremely supportive of me during this time to take time from work to get support and however I needed to transition back to work, even take some further time off. And so I'm just really grateful to be around, like, such a really thoughtful community. And especially thank you to my single buddy, Dana. I know she's here. <laughs> so in regards to question two, what were the most useful ways you leveraged the Seagull Network and Seagull Program resources over the past year? So for one thing, I ended up applying to the Seagull Leadership Development Fund, and I thankfully was approved. And so I think just leveraging those little opportunities that you have, whether that be financial opportunities or other networking opportunities, I think is really important to keep in mind, not just in terms of the Seagull Foundation, but in any program that you're applying to. Additionally, I would say connecting and leveraging my Seagull Buddy Network uh, my buddy Edith, she's amazing, and she is an Atlanta-based Seagull Fellow, and Susie was actually able to connect us, a bunch of us Atlanta Seagull Fellows together, and so this past summer, we also had the time to chat and just connect, and so I think that was something that I really value, learned that I value about the Seagull program, that it offers connection, but not just connection, I would say friendship as well, so it's a personal and professional development. Um, now, our last question, which is, what keeps you going through tough and emotional and exhausting work? And what advice would you offer to others in wanting, in and wanting to go into similar fields? So, Amelia? Yeah, I think that <laughs> the students and the people that I worked with really motivated me to keep doing the work that I was doing. Like, I would spend hours putting to the course material the coots the word walls and but i remember i told you guys we we're doing present continuous we did it a lot <laughs> i'm very sick of present continuous at the moment but i thought about how one student really struggled with it still another student um wanted to learn more about american culture through the different activities that we were conducting and so it's kind of like their desires their needs um and kind of their dreams that really inspired me to keep going through it. Um, and the advice that I would offer is always 
um, stick up for yourself, always put yourself first. Um, what I mean by this is that although you will be doing work um, and helping others, um, you shouldn't um, jeopardize your mental health um, at all when doing this work because then you jeopardize your ability to help them. Um, and so always stick up for yourself and always um, advocate for your, your needs. Amazing. Thank you, Amelia. Got it. To be honest, I think I'm still kind of navigating um, how to do this well. Um, I think one thing that was useful for me, particularly this summer, was just like giving voice to the fact about that I was feeling like this was very tough and very exhausting and very draining work. And luckily I was on a team that really validated that. So it made me feel like I wasn't the only person, you know, feeling that. Um, and I think just like giving voice to it can kind of help with like a release in that way. But I think also remembering that you're not the only person that's doing the work, right? No good work is done by yourself. And so I think realizing that it's all done like in community and in coalition with other people um, can definitely help it feel less exhausting um, and less daunting sometimes. So I think just remembering those things um, is what I would say. I would definitely agree with what Catherine said and I would also add on, um, that like, I think um, I'm just gonna credit it to Congresswoman Presley, but like he always says like joy is part of the resistance, and it's just like always finding joy in the moments that like when you're in key, when you're doing self care, knowing how it relates to the bigger goal or whatever you're driven by. So for me, I just always remember that it's just like knowing when you're doing to take care of yourself or what you're doing to communicate with others is definitely related to the bigger cause. Amazing, thank you. So due to time, we're going to skip Anthony's answer, um, and we're going to open up the stage for Q&A. So please raise your hand, the mic will go to you, and online, either pop the questions in the chat or raise your hand. Dean Madison. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, it's, it's not on, I'll say it again. Thank you, uh, everyone. <laughs> It was absolutely inspiring. I'm curious, you know, these are journeys where each of you spoke almost like an evolution of your thinking and your development of soft and hard skills. What was the scariest thing? <laughs> um, it was all easy. No, absolutely not. I think part of it that's, I think that something that comes, that's kind of scary, that comes with having an evolution like this is realizing that, you know, you had it wrong almost in a way. Um, I think like realizing that, you know, you started here and you're kind of like, wow, I can't believe that that's, that's maybe what I used to think, or maybe that's used to how I have to approach this. I think realizing that, um, you know, you, you're growing, which is good, right? But it's kind of scary sometimes when you're like, oh, I maybe didn't think about this the way I should have, um, which I think is important, right? And I think that's how you have that evolution process. Um, but I think that's the first thing that, that came to mind. I don't know if that's necessarily scary sometimes, but it felt scary to me. <laughs> I think for me, I was more in the research instead of like the policy organizing part or policy advocacy part. So there was less pressure, but it's also like, there's already certain things that can you believe that the reason why housing rates were going up or rents or like mortgages were going up. And so it was finding research that went actually countering that and also how to present it in a way that wasn't negating community voice, but just saying, this is the reality of where things are and this is how we got here, not necessarily because of like outside investors, but more so about like lack of housing and housing shortages and the demand being up. Yeah. Thank you. I want to add one quick thing too, just on top of the thing is that I will still get it wrong. And that's also scary. Are there any chance? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, I think one of the scarier things was like my maybe the mistakes that I made because I felt like that they wouldn't like affect everyone else, um, more particularly my students. So for example, grammar wise, I'm an English major, but I'm still really bad at grammar. 
um, which is why I never really liked doing the present continuous, like cahoots and things like that, because I always felt like I was going to mess up, but I didn't. Um, but like in class, uh, there'd be questions about um, grammatical usage, especially with like American cultural like language. So for example, um, fun and funner, more fun and funner. Um, in the US, we tend to say more fun, but funner is technically grammatically correct. Um, and so it's those things that, um, those kind of conversations, I feel like, well, it can go either way. Am I wrong? Am I right? Am I right? Am I wrong? And um, those are kind of the scary parts. Thank you. Yes. See, Madison says thank you. I heard, I heard. Oh. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Sylvia, give me one second as the mic gets to you. Yeah, um, I'd just be curious to hear whether or not your summer internship changed or kind of affirmed your views for what you want to do past graduation. I'll answer to the summer here. <laughs> um, I think for me, it definitely reaffirmed like why I'm in housing and why I'm like advocating for affordable housing. But I think what I learned in housing is just like the importance of like having it be centered in actual data and research and also community voice too, but also balancing the two and making sure that like we're understanding where this is coming from, but also validating it with the facts too. Great question. Um, it definitely validated what I want to do in a way, like ideologically, like the sector I want to work in, but also where in that field I want to work in, I think. Um, PLS is really uniquely situated, I think, in between like having at, like access to folks that are directly impacted by the policies, but then also be in a position to advocate alongside coalition partners and on the legislative end of things. So I feel like I realized that I really kind of like this middle advocacy lane um, and I kind of like being able to be legislatively adjacent, um, not necessarily probably in it, um, but also still, of course, always centering the, those with the direct um, experience. So um, definitely, and I would love to work at an organization like PLS um, after graduation. Um, can I speak? Okay, cool. Um, I think that it affirmed my desire to work in education um, and also my desire to teach English as a second language. Um, I did in this program specifically work with um, middle-aged um, individuals who range from like 30, 40, and even um, you know older than that. Um, I do like working with kids though. When I work with Breakthrough Collaborative, it was like, fun. I mean, it was fun this summer too, but working with kids um, brings a different kind of unique vibrancy to the classroom. Um, and so I would probably want to work with kids if I do um, decide to teach English as a second language post-graduation. Awesome, thank you all so much. Awesome, no more questions. Um, we're gonna pass it on to Susie to close this. Thank you, everybody. And um, I do also just want to read a chat that Phyllis Siegel just shared for everyone online so that people in person can see. Uh, thank you each for giving us a window into your experience this summer and also how helpful you found the spring cohort meetings, your buddies, and the leadership development fund. I'm so glad that your beginning in the Siegel Network was so successful. So thank you for everything, Phyllis. Um, and we're honored to have our closing from Interim Dean Maria Madison, who has been a great champion of the Siegel program since she got here, coming down to DC to our 10th anniversary and our retreat and presenting to fellows in 2018, coming and presenting at our 2019 retreat and being a champion for the Siegel program, not just for the fellows that are here at Heller and Brandeis, but um, for the fellows across the country, some of whom, some of our lifelong fellows are in the audience here in person and online. So thank you for all that you've done. I feel like Susie and I have been on the same journey. I think we started almost the same month or within the same month, so back in 2017, 2018. And it is incredibly humbling to be here and exhilarating and sad at the same time. One of the greatest things about Heller are the students. 
And it's our honor to watch and assist in every way possible for the students to graduate and to get to know you because you're all heroes and phenomenal, but it's also pretty sad. So, you know, I stand in front of you, kind of sad to know you're walking away, but also humbled because I know, um, especially with the answer to that question about what's your scariest thing is to recognize, you know, that you um, will make mistakes or, you know, will change your understanding of things. That's humbling and absolutely inspiring. So thank you for choosing Heller. And an immense thank you to Phyllis and John, um, who have created this community of change makers. And especially thank you to uh, everyone in the audience, which includes the alumni and our fellows, but also most importantly to Susie and Carmela and uh, just another <laughs> appreciation to those, you know, and each of you for creating what I've been saying uh, quite often today, this solidarity dividend of change makers, people who are making the world a better place. And if I understand correctly, it's 15 years of creating change makers and there are 150 of you out in the world. And this year's cohort is just the best, um, the best example of those 150 folks. So as I was listening to the presentation, some had the chance to read in advance, I was creating a word cloud in my mind because you're also teachers and the words you raise are things that I'm gonna embrace and keep with me. And they remind me, I think Anthony said it, that the soft skills are as important as the hard skills. And each of you said something so absolutely, absolutely inspiring that I want to keep with me. So I have word cloud in my head popping up. And so these were some of those words coming from Anthony, Amelia, Jovita, Catherine, and Sena. The important skills, listening and emotional support, equity, reform, Digital literacy, it might sound like a hard skill, but I think it kind of, I'm looking at Sylvia probably goes on in both camps. Versatility, a holistic, authentic support. Advocacy, stepping outside of my comfort zone. Working on the intangibles. Transformation, taking grace. So I will close my comments, my comments with brevity to say thank you as a community for making space to create transformative grace and joy and solidarity dividend, especially to the Seagulls who created that space, the supporting team, all the fellows and the alumni. Thank you to each of you. Thank you so much, Dean Madison. And in the chat, Phyllis Siegel echoed her thanks for your support as well to everyone. Um, so yes, just to echo Dean Madison, thank you, Carmela. Also, our colleague, Lanny Eisenberg, has been facilitating the Zoom today. Um, and to our fellows in the 2023 cohort online and here and recording in Argentina, uh, thank you for joining us in this lifelong program. To our lifelong fellows, thank you for being a part of this network. To all of our Seagull founders, partners, donors, and supporters, and to everybody here at Heller, Brandeis, and beyond. Um, let's, let's keep doing it. <laughs> Just a quick plug for our social media, you know, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you want more information, you can reach, you can reach, um, you can find more information online or contact us directly. We're happy to chat and connect and also create programs together. It's very open. So thank you for coming to me. Thank you.